Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Finger. I'm director of the New York Eye Cancer Center and a specialist in ocular tumor, orbital disease, and ophthalmic radiation therapy. Thank you for inviting me to talk about treatment of radiation retinopathy. I'd like you to think of plaque radiation therapy as a trade. Radiation is used to destroy the choroidal melanoma to save a life. However, we've traded for a progressive retinal disease called radiation vasculopathy. On the top left, you'll see the choroidal melanoma we previously saw, and in the posterior pole, we see the radiation retinopathy before treatment. At the time, we waited for radiation retinopathy to become severe before we started treatment many years ago. The vision is 2050. And eight months after periodic intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy, we were able to see resolution of many of the findings of radiation retinopathy and reduction of edema in the macula resulting in 2025 vision. For a moment, let's consider the pathophysiology of radiation retinopathy. First, radiation retinopathy is dose-dependent. Above a certain threshold, there is significant vascular cell loss. When parasites are lost, we have increased vascular permeability, resulting in tissue edema. Cystoid macular edema causes vision loss, at first metamorphopsia, and later overall decline in visual acuity. Other effects are neovascularization and shunting vessels, trying to make up for the hypoxia. Later, we see a dominant pattern associated with endothelial cell loss. This occlusive vasculopathy also results in loss of vision, but is not remedial by anti-VEGF therapy. Here we see FINGER's radiation risk guidelines. These guidelines were developed from research I performed at the New York Eye Cancer Center as published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. What you see is doses less than 15 gray to the fovea carry a low risk or are unlikely to be associated with radiation maculopathy. Doses greater than 50 gray carry high risk and almost all those patients will have that side effect. It's important to note that radiation vasculopathy starts at the time of plaque therapy. The severity of radiation vasculopathy is related to the dose of radiation employed. In general, treatment of radiation vasculopathy requires continuous periodic anti-VEGF suppression. Like many diseases, drugs suppress the disease, they don't cure it. VEGF production is reduced by tissue ablation, so for select cases, additional laser photocoagulation and sometimes even cryotherapy is employed. Here we have a subfoveal choroidal melanoma treated with palladium-103 ophthalmic plaque brachytherapy in 2003. You'll notice the fovea dose is in excess of 50 gray, in fact 80 gray. Treatment with Avacin was started in 2007, and he was given injections every six to eight weeks. Eight years later, in 2015, he was 2020. Unfortunately, he moved to Italy, and I hear he's doing quite well, but do not get periodic follow-ups. Similarly, intervitreal anti-VEGF therapy works for anterior radiation optic neuropathy. This was the first patient treated for such and was 2032 and within three months normalized the optic disc visual acuity returned to 2020. Eight years of continuous treatment resulted in 2025 vision despite the fact that this was a juxtapapillary choroidal melanoma treated with slotted plaque therapy. So what are my secrets for vision preservation at the New York Eye Cancer Center? Well, they're basically tight suppression and anti-VEGF dose escalation. 
In the beginning, we used 1.25 milligrams of Avastin and found that 2.5 milligrams often worked better. In the beginning, we treated every six to eight weeks and reduced that eventually to starting every six weeks, but reduce the interval further as the patients require as measured by visual acuity, OCT measurements, and other parameters. Typically, patients who have been on medication for a long time require monthly dosing. We also sometimes switch to other drugs. Lucentis or ILEA sometimes will work for patients who are resistant or become tachyphylactic to Avastin. Lastly, we introduce steroids for polypharmacy. Sometimes polypharmacy is required to maintain stability. Consider that there are many medical problems that require more than one drug for control. They have. Here's one. A patient started anti-VEGF therapy in 2010 and was 2020 at the time. In four years later of continuous anti-VEGF suppression, the patient is still 2020 with a fairly normal architecture seen on OCT. Six months after stopping anti-VEGF therapy, you see a massive increase in retinal edema and vasculopathy with swelling on the OCT and a visual acuity of counting fingers at one foot. This is a common finding when people stop treatment. So what are the main conclusions of this talk? Well, I suggest that you choose your plaque wisely. Not all plaques are created equal. In fact, beta plaques tend to have a much higher dose at the base to apex compared to, say, gamma plaques like iodine and palladium-103. Early anti-VEGF intervention for high-risk patients can clearly prevent or delay vision loss. Intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy slows the progression or suppresses radiation vasculopathy. It does not cure it. Dose escalation, drug switching, and polypharmacy strategies can be used to prolong vision retention. And remember, if a patient wants to stop, it, it, even for six months, the clinically evident vasculopathy will increase and there will be severe irreversible loss of vision. I'd like to thank you for sharing this time discussing the diagnosis and treatment of radiation retinopathy. Uh, it is a much bigger subject than can be covered in this short period. However, it is important to note that we have an opportunity to maximize our patient's vision with periodic intravitreal anti-VEGF therapy and some other techniques. You can see uh, my track record by going to my website, eyecancer.com, and up on the upper right-hand corner, you'll see, see Dr. Finger's results. They are published in the January issue of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. I invite you to read our article. I invite you also to uh, congratulate all the fellows that uh, helped put it together and make it happen. Uh, which you see in this beautiful slide. Thank you for sharing them with me in New York, and I look forward to meeting you in India. I want to take a moment to thank you for your attention and to thank the Eye Cancer Foundation, who supported much of the research presented in this lecture, and for their committed support for international multicenter cooperation in ophthalmic oncology. Thank you and have a nice day.